This is real fundamental stuff. This is animal husbandry, mostly. If you deal with cattle or pets or almost any other animal, a lot of this is going to apply. I've taken those rules and applied them to beekeeping pretty much, but they transfer real easy. I got chickens and I've got ducks, and they all kind of make the same, <coughs> they all kind of need the same things. And when I'm dealing with people just starting out with beekeeping, a lot of them don't have that feel. Insects are so alien to what their thinking is that they don't apply the same sorts of rules to insects that they do to their cats or their cattle. So um, a lot of this, if you've been around animals or bees for a while, is going to be pretty familiar. But I've come up with, I quit a 10, because where, where do you stop? Um, but number one, if you're going to be a beekeeper, you've got to have good queens. Pure and simple, no explanation. Um, it starts there. They have to be, the queens that you have have to be raised in luxury. And here's what I mean by raised in luxury. Um, the, the, the biggest problem we have, and we're going to get to it, is Varroa, without a doubt. But everybody, everybody has to contend with Varroa. And with Varroa come the chemical problems, the wax contamination. We're going to talk about that more. Bees, <coughs> queens raised in contaminated wax aren't as good as queens raised in clean wax, period. If the queens you are getting are coming from a queen breeder who is routinely treating with, with uh, any of the hard chemicals, you're going to have a queen that's not as good as a queen that is raised in clean wax, period. So when you're buying queens, find out what they're doing. Ask them. If they say, yeah, I you know, treat routinely with this, this, and this, then, then you may want to find a different queen breeder. Now, if they're, if they're dealing with what I call the soft chemicals or the organic acids, it's a different story. If they're using essential oils or they're using formic or they're using oxalic, it's a different story because you're not going to have contaminated wax. But if they're using the hard chemicals, even some of the soft chemicals, try and find somebody that isn't. Raised in luxury, extremely well-mated. Uh, big problem this year is swarm queens can't fly because it's rained. Rained, 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 rained. And they're not getting mated. But what about where you're getting your queens? What was it doing the first week in April in Georgia when your queens were getting mated to send up here in those packages that you bought? How do you know? Weather channel, on your phone. <clears throat> when you know your queens are going to be arriving on this week, back it up a month and take a look at the weather. What's the weather been doing down there? Because the best queen raised in the best place in the world, if she doesn't get made, it isn't going to do you any good at all. So have an idea. Ask the breeder what the weather's been. And sometimes you don't get a chance. You, you go to some guy's house, and he's got 400 packages, and you pick it up, and you don't have a clue, and he doesn't have a clue. But at least find out where they came from. If you can find out where they came from, you can have an idea of what to expect from that queen on how well she was mated. Healthy beyond belief. That goes, same thing, is where did she come from? Was, was where she come from a good, a good place to be? And what are you putting her into? What's your box like? Is your box, if you've got three, four-year-old comb in there, she, her days are numbered, pure and simple. And, and it's your job to make sure that when you get her, that's where she goes. She goes into the best place in the world. She needs every opportunity to excel, and it's your job to make sure that she does. An egg-laying machine. You need a big population. It takes a lot of bees to make a lot of honey, right? You've got to have a lot of bees. How do you get a lot of bees? You've got to have a lot of eggs. How many eggs per day does a queen lay? How do you know? Because the book said so? That guy in a magazine said so? How do you know eggs per day? Here's how you know. Sealed brood. You can see the numbers. How many, how many square inches are on a deep frame? You measure the sealed brood. And it's real easy to take a piece of plexiglass or a piece of something and mark off square inches and hold it up to that frame and say, that's about 27, that's about 4, that's about 9. And you mark them down and you add them up. And you get square inches of sealed brood. Multiply it by 25 because there's 25 cells per square inch. Divide that number by 12 eggs per day. That, that sealed brood may have been sealed this morning. It may have been sealed 11 and 3 quarter days ago. But it's still tw that, 
a 12-day period of sealed brood. That's how many days, that's how many eggs she laid divided by 12 in one day. Then you'll know and you'll find out that the books are wrong. <laughs> Trust me, the guy who did most of this work up in Canada, <clears throat> he, found, he found a couple of queens that were doing about 2,400 a day. He said they were exceptional. He said 15, 16, that's what you're going to see. 15, 16. At 2,000, I mean, somebody may, I think somebody made it up. They just guessed. I don't know. But if you figure 2,000, you're not going to be too far wrong. But if your queen is at 1,100, because you actually went out and counted one time, you got a queen that isn't doing what she should be doing, right? Or could be doing better. Why isn't she? Is she old? Is she in a bad, did she did not have enough help, you know, not enough workers? Whatever, whatever it is, you're, you need a queen in there. It's an egg-laying machine, and 1,100 a day ain't quite it. So take a look at how many eggs per day. Good genetics. Adapted to your location. And, and here's a problem. Unless you've got a 15th generation Albion, Michigan queen that's been raised here, you probably don't have a bee that was, that was raised to be here. There's room. Come on in. Um, because they come from Georgia, they come from California, maybe they came from Michigan, maybe there's somebody locally, then that's, that's, that's a way better choice. But getting queens adapted to your location is tough to do. And generally, bees that are grown in Georgia do okay up here. But I can tell you that the third generation queen that come from my part of Ohio does a lot better in Ohio than that queen. And I've done it again and again and again. So if you can find a queen that's adapted to your location, that's your first choice. Generally, it isn't. But keep looking or do it yourself. There's the challenge. Why aren't you raising your own queens? Suitable to your management? Here's, here's, here's my problem with, raise, with keeping bees. I'm not at home this weekend. I'm here. And I'm here or somewhere else a lot Whoops, wrong way. I'm, I'm here somewhere else a lot in the spring. I'm not doing in April what I should be doing because I'm on the road someplace. I'm not doing in May what I'm supposed to be doing because I'm on the road someplace. So if I have queens that get up really early in the spring, like Carniolans, boom, they're ready to go. And I'm not there, they're in the trees. Russians, on the other hand, like to sleep in just like I do. They're not ready until late May. They don't even think about spring until almost half of spring is gone, just like I do. So when I say you know, suitable to your management, that's the kind of bee I'm looking for. I don't want to try and make my bee live by my lifestyle, because my bee ain't going to do it. They're going to do what they're going to do. So I'm going to find a bee that does what I do, and then we're going to get along a whole lot better. So if you're, if you're antsy in the spring, you want somebody that wakes up early and you're out there in snowshoes because I got to keep bees, then get bees that wake up early. But if you're like me and you're not there all spring, get bees that sleep in. You're going to have a lot more fun and you're going to do a lot better if you do that. Resistant to common problems, that kind of goes without saying it's a lot like being adapted. Resistant to a varroa. Is there a bee that's resistant to varroa? Russians to a degree more than any others that I know. And that's another reason that I like them. But, but there are hygienic bees, and they do better than bees that aren't hygienic. So if you're looking for something that deals, deals somewhat well with Varroa, there's that Varroa hygienic bee. They do pretty well. They're, the hygienic bees do well with some of these other problems. Look in that direction. If you're raising your own queens, again, go back to adapted to your location. If you're raising your own queens, that's something you're going to want to be selecting for. Efficient producers. Uh, goes back to eggs per day. How, efficient, how, many, how many eggs is your queen laying, and when is she laying them? If she's like my Russian queen, I missed, I missed the whole maple flow. Totally. They slept through it totally. There, wasn't a, there, there were eight bees in that box, maybe more. But so if, I'm, if I need an early flow, if I need bees that are going to take advantage of an early flow, Russians aren't it. So when is your flow? 
build your population before your flow instead of on your flow and you're going to make a lot more honey. Know when your flow is and when your bees are going to wake up and start producing more bees and you're going to do a lot better and well behaved. If you've got bees in town, you know this is a cardinal rule number one. They got to play nice. Because if they don't, you've got neighbors who are going to be on your case. So, but you know, I hate wearing a bee jacket. On a, I, and I go out there on a hot day, I want as little protection on as possible. I got a veil that almost isn't there. And that's, if, my, if my bees give me a hard time and I can't wear that veil, that, those bees go away. It's not fun. I'm, I, I enjoy working bees and I like making honey, but I'm not going to go out there and hurt because of it. I'm gonna, I, I want bees that are nice. So I'm encouraging you to have, because you can have bees that produce just as much honey that are meaner and snot than mine, which are kittens. I like bees that are kittens. <coughs> this came out of the University of Wisconsin, which used to be a powerhouse in beekeeping. And, and it, it, an average queen in a great colony is still going to do better than the best queen in the world in a colony that isn't doing anything because you're not taking care of it or because something's going on that you missed. So this is kind of comes down to how well is your queen going to do? How well is the colony she's in? And you'll, you'll do better. Pest management. I said Varroa. We all know that. You've got to deal with Varroa. I, I could, should say end of story, because it is. You've got to deal with Varroa. Here's, here's the challenge with Varroa, and it's, it's a moving target. It's been a moving target for 30 years. Is not only is it Varroa, but it's the viruses. And the viruses are escalating. There's more of them in your colony now than there were 20 years ago, and they're more virulent now than they were yesterday. So not only dealing with Varroa, but dealing with the viruses. But to deal with the viruses, you've got to deal with Varroa. There's, there's a lot of, has been over the years, a lot of talk on thresholds. How many Varroa can you have in your colony and still thrive? And I've seen it go from 20 to 5. And the commercial people in California now that are staying in business and thriving, it's one. Any time of the year, one. You've got one Varroa in your colony. Remember, that's, that, that one is one, one Varroa per 100 bees which is only 20% of the varroa population in your colony. So you're looking at five bees per hundred, five varroa per hundred bees really in your, in, uh, that are in your colony that you're going to have to deal with somewhere down the line. One. You do the ether roll or you do the <coughs> alcohol wash or whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, I've stepped back from sticky boards. They're, they're, they make you feel good, but they're not telling you much of a story. You got to you got to have a you got to have a better number than than what sticky boards are telling you, and and alcohol or or ether roll is a better story, and you do the the quarter cup, half cup of bees, it's about three hundred, and you shake the heck out of them in alcohol, and you count the mites, and if you've got more than one, now is the time to move. What are you going to do? Well, there's a lot we're going to talk about. There's a lot of stuff that you can do that isn't going to contaminate your wax. Hard chemicals are going to contaminate your wax, but at the same time, you've got to do something. It may be hard chemicals because it came out seven, and now you've got to, not, that colony is almost dead and doesn't know it yet. There's all the other things, fall broods and nosemas. Nosemas have been tricky, and, and I don't know that they have a handle on nosema yet. They're, Every, every time I read a new paper that's out on Nozema, they're telling me a little bit different story. This is Saran. I, uh, Nozema apis is pretty much not in the picture anymore. And Nozema serrani, and it's building, and you're seeing problems later in the summer rather than the spring or late winter when, when Nozema apis used to be a problem. And, and I had supper with Tom Webster last night, who probably knows more about Nozema than anybody. And what they just haven't got it figured out. They'll take a sample from a colony and they'll they'll look at they'll look at these bees that were on the outside frame and they'll count spores and they'll have seven to ten million spores per bee, and then they'll take from the same colony two frames over none. Now they're finding out that they think maybe Nozema can infect larva, which makes no sense because that's a gut disease, but. It may be a place where Nozema resides, and then it gets, when it gets fed, it gets transferred to another worker. So they haven't got Nozema. Pay attention to this, because that story hasn't been told yet. 
and, and more is going on. Wax moths, small hive beetle, trachea mites, we still have to deal with all of those. It's common sense, day-to-day -day stuff. But if you don't do it, it's gonna come up and bite you. Anybody store supers outside in the summer? Stack them like this. You'll have wax moth, not many, and the, what they eat is the stuff you should have gotten rid of in the first place, the stuff that's four years old and black as the ace of spades. That's the stuff they go for. The new stuff, they're not gonna bother. Light and air. Light and air, if you stack them in your garage, if you stack them outside under a lean-to, whatever it is, light and air, you want to you try something, take an old frame, throw it on your garage floor, leave it there for a month. Come back and take a look at it. The top of it will still be just as nice and clean, as pristine as it was when you threw it down or roll it over. What are you going to have? A mess. Light and air, that's, that's what's up. You don't need chemicals for wax moth, period. Skunks and bear, skunks up off the ground, bear, big tough fence. Big, tough fence. That'll probably solve that problem. Um, pest management, you got to do it. But you do it with your cats for fleas. You do it with your chickens for all of the diseases they get. And, and, and you got to do it with bees. Um, <clears throat> I go both ways with control swarming. If you're going to be a beekeeper and you want to make, and you want to manage, and you want to make honey, and you want to be a good beekeeper, then you're going to control swarming. If you're one of those people that like repopulating the natural population of bees out in the world, then you don't have to control swarming and life gets a lot simpler. You don't make nearly as much honey, but you're putting bees back. Anyway, <coughs> all of those things, you know swarm control. Swarm control starts late September for next spring when you're making splits to go to overwinter. That's also good for varroa control. Perfect for varroa control. You're solving two problems at once. Uh, but that's when swarm control starts. So anticipate population growth, provide room in advance, all of the things that the books say. And they all kind of work, but you got to do them. You got to be out there when it's raining. You got to be out there when it's cold. You got to be out there. You got to be out there. It kind of comes down to that. Safe environment. Um, I say, uh, Keep your equipment in perfect uh, condition, and the, the the simple the simple way to look at that is: Are your boxes nailed together and square? That's the obvious one. But is your equipment in good shape? Are your you know top bars solid? And just all of the fundamental stuff that you should have been looking at last winter when you didn't have anything else to do is keeping your equipment in good shape. Clean wax. That's the big one. Um, if you've been following this story about what's in wax in the last four or five years, you wouldn't put foundation in your colony. And that's what I'm saying to do. Don't put foundation in your colony. Use plastic foundation. The stuff that is being sold by all of the vendors over there, the stuff that, that you've got that you're, if you're treating uh, with any of the chemicals, the stuff is, is not safe for bees. It'll kill queens, it'll kill bees, it'll slow down your colony. <clears throat> we took, we've taken a look at random samples of wax coming into the root company because beeswax is, our, is what we live and die on. We have to have beeswax. <clears throat> Millions of parts per billion, which should scare you. Don't use foundation. Put plastic foundation in your colony and switch it out after two, maybe three years if you don't treat. The agricultural chemicals that are coming back in are almost as bad, but the stuff that beekeepers are putting in are, is worse. It's the worst stuff you can put in your colony. And I say that very carefully because that's what you learned. That's what we all grew up on is wax foundation. But wax foundation is not good stuff anymore. We have fouled our nest, and now we have to live with it. <coughs> Isolated from other bees. This goes two ways. One is, is your neighbor as good a beekeeper as you are? Probably not, right? They're, you know. And as a result of that, he's sharing all of his problems with you. And, and all of the varroa and all of the other diseases and all of the stuff that can go wrong in a hive, he's sharing with you because your bees are over there taking advantage of his sick colonies, bringing it home and spreading the wealth. Uh, the other problem is migratory beekeeping. Where, are, where is that 
where is that guy from Florida setting his bees down to make a honey crop in your backyard? If you're raising queens, that's, that's a bad thing. That's bad enough, but Africanized bees, who knows what he's got, small high beetle. Migratory beekeeping is becoming an issue, more of an issue because they've got different stuff down there than we have up here and we're gonna to have to learn to live with it. Migra Africanized bees aren't gonna to have to migrate. We're, we're putting them on trucks and sharing them with the rest of the world very fine, thank you. And, and it's only gonna get worse. So if you know of migratory beekeeping, know where they go. So you can get your bees out of there. It's sad, it's, 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 it's like agriculture pesticides. If a farmer's gonna spray, we have to move our bees, right? We have to do something so they can spray. Why is that? Why do we have to move? Why don't they stay over on their side of the fence? It's the same thing with migratory bees. Why do we have to protect ourselves from these trespassers? Do I sound a little angry? And that's avoid pesticides. You know, and, and it's hard to do, and it's getting harder to do. And I don't know the answer to that, but if you can get five miles away from anything that's ever going to be sprayed or has been seed treated, get five miles away because, because it's going to be a problem. Keep good records. That goes without saying. I, but, you know, I have the best records for May you have ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> By July, I can't even find the book. So don't use me for an example. But good records, good records go back, will, will, will save your butt a hundred times five years from now when you go to try something or you go to get something from somebody. And have extra equipment. If, you, if, you, if your life depends on putting bees on a truck in the middle of the night and taking them over to some apple orchard someplace and your truck breaks, what do you do? Know what to do. Know the guy to call in the middle of the night and say, can I borrow your truck or can you come over? And it's the same, it, no matter what it is, your extractor, anything that you use, know where you can get another one right now. If bees are putting food on your table, you gotta have it. So be able to go and get, get another one right now. <clears throat> enough room at the, at the right time, enough room for bees brew. Nectar, you ever thought about nectar? When bees come back to the colony with a load of nectar, they give it to a house bee who takes it upstairs, adds some enzymes to it, takes it upstairs and hangs it in a cell. But they don't fill that cell up with nectar. They only put a little bit in there. And then they'll move to the next cell, and then they'll move to the next cell, and then they'll move to the next cell, and pretty soon they're running out of cells to put nectar in because you don't have enough boxes on that hive. You, you plan for boxes for honey, not for nectar. You added a super for honey, but there's enough nectar coming in that you could have added another box. They're not going to use it because they're going to condense it, and by this time tomorrow it will be honey. Maybe the day after tomorrow. But in the meantime, if there's no place to put nectar, the bees are going to quit foraging. You've missed some honey. Think about adding boxes for nectar and see if it doesn't make a difference. I keep doing that, don't I? Which way am I going here? There we go. Nectar. Add room for nectar and see if it doesn't make a little bit of a difference. Not a lot of difference. You're not going to make eight more boxes of honey, but you might make a half a box of honey. And if bees are putting food on your table, half a box of honey is a lot of money. And honey and pollen, of course. You've got to have enough room for honey. If, you're, if your honey supers are full, they're going to quit foraging flat out. And you've missed, you've missed part of the crop. And predicting how much bees, and this has to do a lot with the flow. What, where, what is your main flow? What's blooming when? And how is it, how is it going? Following growing degree days. And, and, and okay, <clears throat> growing degree says this is gonna boom about then. Three days from now, I'm gonna be out of town. I gotta go to a bee meeting. So I better get my boxes on now because it's, uh, by the time I get back, I'm gonna have miss, missed a full day of that honey flow according to growing degree days. One full day, you got two weeks. That's 1 14th of your crop. So knowing what's gonna bloom when and, and being able to predict that and then doing management activity that accommodates that for both you and the bees makes a lot of sense. There it is. <clears throat> Cheapest insurance and the best medicine you can find. Enough good food all of the time for every bee in the bunch. We way underfeed our bees. Way, way, way underfeed our bees. Both protein and carbohydrate. 
And if you're watching the honey flow and suddenly it shuts off, even for a day, well, we've got food stored. Well, maybe you just harvest it. Well, do you know? And that's the question. Do you know? Is there enough good food in there to feed all of the baby bees that are in that colony for three days? They've been going hand to mouth. Everything they bring in, they're storing some, but they're feeding because they're growing population because your queen is laying 2,400 eggs a day. And suddenly you get five days of rain. Is there enough food coming on to make sure that all of the babies in that colony get all of the food that they need? If they're not, you need to be on top of it. and You need to be feeding. Because otherwise you get this dip. And you've got a bunch of bees in this dip, a whole generation of bees in this dip that suddenly are a little bit starved, a little bit damaged. And that's only a few. And that queen's laying 2,400 eggs a day. And that's only a few. And it probably won't make much difference. But what if it was you? You're a, a litter of puppies that you're taking care of. One of your kids. It's not much. But it's a little. And <clears throat> if you're on top of it and you know what's going on in the colony, you know what's going on outside, and you know the population growth, you're going to be there with that protein patty and that sugar syrup before it happens. And they're just going to go right, there won't be that dip. Avoid stress. Uh, I wish it was that simple. Uh, for any of it, don't nurse failing colonies, join small healthy colonies. A small colony is always struggling. It's never, it's, it never catches up. It's under stress all of the time. To get enough kids, to get enough food, to get, have enough heat uh, at night, it's always Join it with a larger colony, if it's not sick. Join it with a larger colony. It's the bees that you're joining to that colony are going to be immediately released from, from, from some stress. And you've got one less colony to take care of to, that you've been, you've been nursing all this time. Join it to another colony. Let, give them a break and give yourself a break. Don't waste time on dinks. And here's a dink, and that's kind of what this is, a small, healthy colony that you just, I just know she's going to be OK. She'll turn it around. Ever have one of those? She, that's a good queen. She's so pretty. She, I, I know she's, don't waste your time. Give the bees in that box a break. Join them to a small colony. Take your losses in the fall. That's, that goes back 200 years. But it's still true. Don't try and get a sick colony through the winter. They're going to be dead. And you have spent time and money and resources trying to save a colony that was dead in September and didn't know it yet. Be proactive with food, queens, medications, and room. Common animal husbandry sense. I could say this with well, my cats, my dogs, my ducks, the goat next door. Same exact thing. But you got to do it. Winter well. <clears throat> You guys have even more winter here than I do in Ohio. I, I, I learned bees up in northern Wisconsin. So, I'm, so if, you ever, if you ever go to a Wisconsin football game, you'll see that the, the football players have a big white, white W on the side of their helmet. That stands for winter. And, and so I learned wintering pretty well up in Wisconsin. Enough food store. How much, how much? You got a bottom board. You got two deeps with frames and bees and brood and honey. Uh, inner cover and a cover. How much did that weigh? 150 pounds. Give that man a medal. That's what it should weigh. If it weighs less, you got a problem. You're missing something. Maybe the bottom board. But probably not that. Probably you're missing enough stored food. How I do it is this. This is just so brain dead simple. You know the old heft thing? You know, if you can't lift it? It's, it's, it's good enough for winter. Well, what I can't lift now is a lot less than what I couldn't lift 30 years ago. So I got one of those sprint, you know, you weigh the front, weigh the back, put the numbers together, you got the weight of the colony. It's just real simple. It takes one person one minute to do that. And then you know, you're not guessing. If it's 180 pounds, you can move on. If it's 140 pounds, mark it. You got to do something to it. You got to get, you got to get food into it. You got probably honey, certainly, and, or carbohydrates, and probably pollen also. You've got to get that food in there. And <coughs> superior population. That egg, it goes back to that eggs today. Now, when you're measuring eggs per day, 
your queen, the best queen in the world, is going to be laying more eggs per day today than she is in October, right, or September. She's ramping down rapidly. So if you, if you measure eggs per day in October and she comes up with 200, are you going to get rid of her? Probably not. She's probably doing exactly what she should be doing. But you still need a superior population of bees that were born back in August and September. That's when winter really starts for the population of bees going into winter is in August. And that's what you need to do. That's when you're looking at your queen, is how is she doing in August? Because that's going to tell me how they're going to be doing in February. So this really makes a lot of sense. Take care of the bees that take care of the bees that go into winter. Think of it like this. If your grandparents are sick, they're not taken care of. They're, they are fed, they got raw, they got virus, whatever. Their generation isn't going to be able to take care of your parents. Same thing. Even if, you, even if you go in and you clean up the varroa in your grandparents' generation and you get rid of it, you've still got damaged bees taking care of your parents' generation. Damaged bees, they're, they're not producing the enzymes, they don't have enough food, they're damaged. They, in turn, can't take care of the generation that goes into winter. So because you didn't do something with your grandparents, the bees going into winter are, are damaged without you have no say in it because they're already damaged because of what went on way back when. Take care of the bees that take care of the bees that go into winter. And you're going to be a lot better off. What time am I supposed to quit? Ten after. Ten after. Good. We got time. <clears throat> I say this, extraordinary ventilation. I use, I use screen bottom boards for wintering, not for summer. Although they're open a little bit in the summer. I like a breeze in the colony all summer long. And I pull out that thing about that much in the back, and I leave it open year-round. I like ventilation in the colony. That breeze going right up the back of the colony. And, and not one bee has ever complained to me about it, so I think I must be doing it right. But, but extreme ventilation, and, and you're going to do better. Has anybody here ever used a, a thermal imaging camera on a beehive? I went, to a, I went to a thing a couple of weeks ago. It is just... It's just the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of stuff. This is what you're looking at right here. Where is the, you, you're looking at a, a, any time of the year because it's going to be hot inside the colony. You can tell where the cluster is. You can tell how big it is. You can probably tell how healthy it is by how warm it is. This is going to change keeping bees. Or it's, it's changed it for me already. It's going to change checking bees in almond orchards. You can go out there and you take a pallet of four and you just look at all four and that one's dead. No heat at all. Don't even have to take the cover off. So I'm, I'm marking you down 25% off that pallet. You got a truck going by, load it up to go to California, take one picture, boom, that one's dead, that one's dead, that one's dead. Don't even have to take the covers off. Don't even have to take the net off. And you can tell, this is, this is going to change things. And you'll be able to see, <clears throat> you'll be able to see where the cluster is. How often have you seen two clusters in a colony, both dead? And if you get warning of that ahead of time, you can do something about it. You can get them back together with, with this kind of information. Uh, this is one of those insulating things on top of a colony. There's a lot of ways to do it, but they all work. You have warm air rising, it hits your cold inner cover, it condenses and the water drips back down. If you've got insulation on top of your inner cover, your inner cover is warm, the warm air rises up and goes out your vent instead of condensing on the bottom of your inner cover. Extreme ventilation and insulation. And provide protection, you know a windbreak. But that goes a long way. Just four bales of hay. You wouldn't believe the difference it makes on, on this temperature fluctuation inside of a colony if you just get rid of the wind. And the temperatures, it, it, it's incredible. We did a lot of work in Wisconsin on, on daytime fluctuations, wind breaks, no wind breaks, uh, wrapped, unwrapped, all of those things. And a wind break, and you got almost this. That's what the bees need. Remember that stress thing? Avoid stress. So superior population, uh, good protection, wind breaks, wrapping. Any wrapping is good, any wrapping is better than none, and, and I strongly suggest that you consider doing so. The best stuff that I've found for wrapping is that stuff sold by B&B &B Honey. 
and it's that plastic with a real thin layer of insulation underneath it. And it comes in a roll and you can staple it to your colony or you can tie it on. You know, it's easy to apply, easy to take off, and it does everything a wrap needs to do. It provides, it provides <coughs> another additional windbreak layer and it, because it's black, it absorbs heat and it'll warm up the colony inside a little bit. It's cheap and it's easy to use. So if you're going to wrap, I'm sorry? How long have you had it? I'm sorry? How long have you had it? How long have I had it? Yeah. My, I, mine's going in like 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're, if you're somewhat careful, I staple mine, so I'm kind of hard on yeah. mine. But, the corners are bad, but after the rest of it, it's not bad at all. Yep. It's, it's good. It's cheap. It's easy to use. And it's one more level of protection. It's one more level of avoiding stress. And, and take care of the bees that take care of the bees that go into winter, and that's August up here. That's when you need to be making sure your bees are healthy. You said the name of the company was Better Bee? B&B. B&B. B&B, honey. They advertise in the journals. Right. They're in Minnesota. Yep. Can you over-insulate? Can you over-insulate? You can't over-insulate if you've got ventilation. We had, we had the four square method that they developed in Canada. The guy that developed that was a student at the University of Wisconsin when I was there, and he developed that four pack, and we had bees that were so well insulated they never clustered in the winter. But they had ventilation. So if you've got ventilation, yeah, you're going to eat a lot of food. Yeah. Know that going in. Uh, instead of 100 pounds, he had 150, 160 pounds of honey on every colony, but they were happy bees come spring. Quick question, you're evaluating your bees, you're in there December, first week of December. I think the jury's still out, Kim, on it, but I mean, I was seeing drones in December, first week of December. Turns out those hives were extremely strong coming out, but what's your take on that? <coughs> they probably over, uh, bees get rid of drones in the fall because of what? Resources. If you've got a really good, strong, healthy colony, there's less inclination to get rid of the drones come fall. I mean, there's, we got lots of food guys, stick around. You know, it's when we don't have lots of food guys, get out. And, you know, the retirement program stinks, but on a good, strong colony, you'll often see overwintered drones. I don't know how good they are the second year when it comes to mating. I don't know if that's ever been mentioned, but they're still eating, so. So you would use it as a basis um, somewhat? Well, it's certainly one of, one of the things in the plus column. Yep. Food safety shouldn't be the last rule, but um, it, it, it actually should be the first. Prevent harvest contamination. Keep your crop covered when you're transporting it. Don't overheat your honey. Is honey honey if it doesn't have pollen in it? There are people who say no. That's another story that hasn't been told yet. It'll be interesting to see how that comes out. Make sure that your moisture and store in clean containers and, and all of these things, fundamental food, food stuff, whether it's you're growing tomatoes, potatoes, or, or honey, this all applies. Do no harm. I think this is the do no harm stuff that we can easiest avoid, hard chemicals for varroa. There's too many other things out there that we can be doing to keep varroa in check. You're never ever going to get rid of all of them, probably. But boy, if you can keep that, if you can keep that level down to one or less every time you're checking, you're going to be doing okay. It's the virus. And if you don't have a lot of adult varroa in your colony, you're not going to have a lot of virus. And that's the trick. All of these other things, enough food and, and all these other diseases under control are going to help. And they're going to help your bees be healthy and, and but varroa, but if they're if they if they're hundred percent everywhere else, then varroa become less of a problem and the viruses that go with them do no harm. But you just knew there was going to be more, didn't you? How about some beekeeper rules? And, and, and that's, that's continuing education. You're all here. You've got the first step. You've, you've, you've gotten past getting a magazine and reading a book and going to your, your county meeting. You've, got, you've stepped up advanced skills. You take a queen rearing course, uh, uh, whatever. You learn to pollinate for a living some kind of again, association membership. <clears throat> that used to be a problem. I don't think it is anymore. Boy, I tell you, associations, the years at home doing OK? You got enough chairs? That's getting to be the problem, is there's more people than most of us are used to. Be an officer, but that's the problem. Raise your hand. The world is run by the people who show up. 
Raise your hand and have, have some say in what's going on in your part of the world. You were just raising your hand. OK. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> the next thing is, is teach a class. Step up and, and teach a class. You know a lot. You know more, you'll know more after this week than you did before you, and take some of that home and share it with all of the rest of the people who couldn't be here. Maybe it's just giving a one-hour talk once, but there we go. But teach a class. Be a mentor. That's tough being a mentor because somebody's demanding your time when you least want to share it, usually. But if you set up, if your club sets up, uh, our club has struggled with this over the years. I think we've got it to the point where there's a set of guidelines for the mentor and the mentee, and if you follow them, most mentors are able to help when they need the help, and most mentees are respectful of that, that, that boundary, and it works pretty well for both, and we've got a pretty good program. But it took a long time to get it set up. When can you call me? You can't call me after supper, or when can you, you know, when shouldn't you call? Don't call me during the day, but get those kinds of guidelines set up. When can I come over? Well, it's raining. You can't come over today. So you need to wrestle with those things. But how many here had a good mentor? And it really made a difference, didn't it? A big difference. So rather than struggle on your own, and you go out there, and you're in the backyard, and your wife is way over there looking, that guy's nuts. And you're trying to figure out what's going on inside this colony. And you don't know, and there's nobody to turn to and ask. Or there's nobody to call on your cell phone and ask. So I'm seeing something. I've never seen it. What the heck's going on? So be a mentor if you can. Beekeeper Health, do you know how to use an uh, EpiPen kit? Learn. You'll save somebody's life someday. I've had the unique opportunity of having to do it twice. And, and, and I knew what to do before the first time. And it makes a difference. You don't panic. You don't. You don't run screaming into the night, you do what you're supposed to do, and that person will be here tomorrow. Uh, how to stop shopping. Uh, shopping. How to stop robbing. Do you know how to stop robbing? You got four colonies in your backyard, and suddenly all hell breaks loose. You got neighbors over at the pool getting stung. You got the guy across the street getting stung, and everybody's screaming at you. How do you stop that right now? Know how to do that. Here's how to, a way to do it. There's two ways to do it. One is you close every colony. You seal them up tight as a drum. All of the bees that are out can't get back in. They're going to stand on the landing board. Nobody can get out to continue robbing. That's pretty fast. And that's usually what I would recommend. That's probably the most best that you can do. The other one is to open everybody up. And then everybody, and everybody is, is liable. Everybody is vulnerable. And you will center the activity. Second choice. When you say close up, robbing in our area happens in August, so I think there needs to be a, or at least I feel like we need to talk about briefly how you close it up, because you don't get duct tape. If I've got neighbors getting stung, I don't care how I close it up. Really? That's, that's the kind of robbing I'm talking about. When you're out in your backyard and you've got a one-week colony and you're harvesting or something, and, and they may be bothering the dog, but that's it. But I'm talking the full-blown, oh my God, we're all going to die robbing situation. That, you have a life-threatening situation. Can you stop it now? Can you kill a colony? I'm, I'm going to ask this question. Can you kill a colony right now if you had to? If you've got a colony that, that a life-threatening situation with a colony, could you kill it right now? In Florida, this is what they do. This is what they teach you. Every bee yard has a large, a great big, large leaf, leaf litter plastic bag in it, laying underneath a colony somewhere. You put that over the colony, you, you shut up the colony, you put it over the colony, you tip it over, and you, you seal the bag, and the colony is dead. You can do it right now. And if you have to save lives, that's what you do. And it works. It works really well on Africanized bees and every other kind of bees. Does your spouse know where every one of your bee yards is? Could she drive there? Could he drive there? And when you don't answer the cell phone because you didn't come home for dinner, does she know where to send the people to get the body? <laughs> and, and, and that happens. So you have a map. Some place have a map. The, the Jones Yard is, you know, and they know where to drive to get the body. So if you don't answer your cell phone, do they know where to go? And this is the one that we talked about, how to save lives. You can do that. 
Take, get one of those yards, get one of those bags, throw it under a colony, and just leave it there. And if you have to do it, it's there. And, and you can do it. It can be done. And I still got some time, I think. I think we're done. Yes? Um, I have one of those meters that's not colonies. How would you get rid of it? How, how would, do, I would do what? <laughs> I have one of those meters that's not colonies. <laughs> how would you take it out? If, if it wasn't being a life-threatening situation and I just wanted to get rid of a bunch of bees, I got, I got two five-gallon pails of soapy water, I take the cover off and I dump them in right now. You know, it's, it's way back out of nowhere, but we have to put on two suits to approach. Yeah. Um, do I get rid of the queen? Do I re-clean? How, how long do you want to put up with meaner and snot? One more time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you, I, I, can, I can depopulate a colony in a hurry if you have to, and that's the way to do it. If, if, if you can go in, if you can, if you can actually put on enough bee suits to go through that colony and find the queen and get rid of her, they'll, their temperament will probably change by tomorrow. Uh, and, and, and you probably, I say carefully, you probably won't have that problem anymore if you can get the queen. It's the, it's the defying death act that you have to do to get, to get rid of her. But would you re-queen or would you let them build another with her genetic? Oh, you want another queen just like the one you had? <laughs> no, but I think there's some different drones. I would, I would get another queen from somebody who could work, who can work bees in their bathing suit. Right. Okay. Yeah, think, think if you're going with their genetics, you're gambling. Yeah. Anything else? I received eight EpiPens free. I'm sorry? I received eight EpiPens for free uh -huh. on Myland. There's a coupon on Myland Pharmaceuticals EpiPen, and you take a very brief survey, and you bring that coupon. I went to CVS, and each prescription comes with two EpiPens, and I got four of them, and I didn't pay a single penny. That's because they're not cheap. No, I know they're like Yeah, they're not cheap. Yeah. My there you go. How do you spell that? Take notes. L-A-N, Myland Pharmaceuticals. And I'm not allergic, but I just said that somebody could be allergic, and it was I got to eat of them. Do you use your insurance? No. You just got the survey. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Do you know there's a talking EpiPen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. I'm not surprised anymore. Uh, <laughs> no, really, really, no. A lot of, lots of emergency equipment comes with that. You know, pull the string, and it'll tell you first do this and first do that. And, yeah. But I hadn't heard about the EpiPen, but... but uh, Get the talking one if you can. <laughs> really? Probiotics. I keep seeing these popping up. I don't know enough to comment. Um, uh, in theory, the theory sounds wonderful, doesn't it? I mean, everybody should be having more probiotics, including your chickens and your bees, and it makes sense because it's the stuff that makes you healthy. I don't know. I've, I haven't seen good numbers. That doesn't mean it's. So you've not personally tried anything. You're waiting to see what people are doing. Yeah, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm carefully leery of things that come in bottles. And and when somebody shows me, uh, 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 what's the, the the feed additive out of Maryland, uh, Mega B. I was I was leery, but that's really good stuff. And 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 I'm I recommend it. But until somebody shows me, I'm just careful. You know, would you give your chickens something? Would you give your chickens probiotics no, or your kids? I haven't given anything. Any, well, I don't need one more thing to write down or buy. You know, that's <laughs> my thought. But if somebody after time says this is great, you know, I'll put Honey Bee Healthy in my... That's what I meant, not Mega yeah. Bee. Honey Bee Healthy, thank I'll you. Put that in, um, yeah. But I haven't, you know, I see them buying it. I see no. them talking about it, but no, I don't... Oh, you can't charge another thing. My, my wife's reading a book on, on good food, and, and we've been reading books on good food, and she has a, out of this book comes a saying, and I don't know where you lie in here, but if God didn't make it, don't eat it. And that's kind of where I am with myself and my bees. And it's got to be, I got to know that it's going to do them good rather than just do good for the guy that's selling it to me. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's conservative and cautious, but... If I wouldn't give it to my kids, I'm going to give it to my bees. You said uh, one of the steps about uh, take your losses in the fall. Does that mean just kill that hive? If it's already diseased, it's weak, you 
sometimes. Uh, if, if, if they're just, if they're riddled with something, yeah. But if they're just weak because you've had a bad queen and she just hasn't been laying and there's not enough bees, join it with another colony and that way you've got one strong instead of one medium and one dead. Do you have to go to another meeting, right? Eventually. So you can all go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>